Sarah Snook stars in the third season of HBO's Succession as Shiv Roy. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. I wanted to ask, I start with maybe a controversial opinion, which is to say that I think of the entire Roy family in this season, Shiv maybe has the best moral compass. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, how you see your character this season in relation to the family. And do you think Shiv is becoming a better person as the series progresses? Ooh, tricky. I, I don't know if she's becoming a better person, but um, does anyone become a better person when they get more embroiled with the Roys? Um, I mean, even Greg, he's, he's suffering, uh, I would think. Um, is she a better person? She's, she, I feel like this whole season is about identifying who she is for, for, for she, like, and whether she has made a decision on that, I don't know, but, um, I think she's um, seeing that she is, you know, she can't help be a part of this family, but that she is uh, different from the members of this family. But maybe not so much after all, you know, I think there is a lot of similarity with between her and Logan. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's difficult when you when you have you know, things that you want to do morally that you think are appropriate and want to be, you know, and I think she does want change. She does want to change the company. And when she has that, uh, meeting with with Kendall and says you know I think we're on the same page she's genuine about that she wants to change but it's about whether Kendall in that moment is genuine and about whether you know can she actually change the company who knows um does she have the courage guts and act and uh, ability <laughs> who knows yeah I wanted to ask you in that early one of the first two episodes of this new season there is a moment where Shiv really does seem to be considering working with Kendall and kind of toppling Logan for in the name of change. Um, I'm wondering what you think is what, what you found was alluring about what Kendall was offering. Um, ultimately, she doesn't she doesn't go that route, as we know. But yeah, what, what was that kind of allure there? Yeah, I mean, it's well, first of all, if 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 Kendall was truly genuine and honest about uh, wanting to change the company, wanting to sort of right the the misdirection of the past, the sort of um, fusty, traditional, old, conservative views, the very um, right wing leaning, maybe uh, the the um, yeah, I mean, conservative really is the is the is the main thing, perhaps. Um, that um, if if Kendall is the person to bring, you know, and also they've gone through the cruise ship scandals and all that kind of stuff and that's like for Shiv to be the face of the company at the moment and in amongst um the kind of bad press that the company's getting which is better to be on to be the face of that or to maybe like lean towards Kendall who might actually be able to with the catalyst that he's given change the company uh but it's about finding whether it's he's genuine or not and I don't think he necessarily turned out to be I don't know uh <laughs> Maybe it was a little talk and not much action, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, you've set up my next question really well in that um, you're named president by Logan um, and you do kind of immediately have to take on this burden at, at the town hall, which has now become this really kind of unforgettable scene uh, from yeah. the third season. So I wanted to ask you about filming that kind of very unsettling and big moment, but then also continuing the emotion for the character into Kendall's office, and we get that really kind of unforgettable and visceral um, moment of Shiv spitting into the book. Um, so just talk us through that incredible uh, sequence. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that like <laughs> being so humiliated and shamed in such a public context for people like the Roy's, particularly for Shiv, who has difficulty being vulnerable and is so capable at putting a defense up, and and really being embarrassed is something that that I think their dad has used against them and to sort of shame them in certain times and, and ways in order to sort of be more powerful them more powerful than them and have control over them but then being publicly shamed in that way the only sort of avenue for response or recourse for revenge is is something just as childish in a way just as like <laughs> base and I love I love that it's spitting in a notebook it's like it's 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 so um, like young. Like there's nothing. It, it, it's like there's there's a naivety to it in a way. But it's just like it's a primal anger that is like I can't. 
use my words because they're not going to work. That I tried that. I can't like yell at you because it'll just be, you will say something sort of you know like histrionic or hysterical woman or something like that. It's just like all I can do really is spit in your <laughs> diary. You know, like I loved it when I read that in the in the script. It was like yeah. I can't wait for that scene. It was just like three lines and big print. I was like, that's the part that I'm looking forward to. How fun. Yeah, it, it is phenomenal. And I think what you're saying touches on something that kind of goes across the entire season, which is the real seeming childhood trauma for each of these Roy characters really comes to the surface in interesting ways. Um, I was wondering if you and have you uh, as an actor kind of thought about what Shiv's childhood was like, or maybe even had explicit conversations with Jesse about, you know, what did Shiv go through, you know, from in her childhood until we meet her oh, yeah. on screen? Yeah, I mean, you sort of create a, a roadmap of, you know, imaginative kind of work and in what what their experiences would have been and, and what what it is like to be shepherded around and farmed off to some, probably in boarding school overseas for a bit or college overseas at least, or, you know, holiday house to holiday house which none of them really feel like a home i love that bit where she's showing her dad all the houses and homes that they have and he just doesn't recognize them it's like the, the monumental wealth that these people have which leaves them sort of lost and kind of displaced in in the world and especially if they don't have a have a home sort of family strength and and foundation to to call home they're kind of yeah displaced and i you know it's great to to invent things that could have happened in, in Shiv's childhood. But I really appreciate how Jesse uh, kind of um, pursues ideas with the right to change his mind, like reserve the right to change your mind kind of thought. And that for me is great. Cause it's like, okay, you've had this idea of what Shiv's childhood was like, and then something else happens in the script. You're like, okay, maybe that was wrong. Okay, well I can change that. That's no one's ever seen that. That's just my own creation. So let's like tamper with it or tinker with it to make it, you know, fit. Yeah, that makes a great deal of sense. Um, something else I really love about the character arc this season, but for all the characters, I mean, it you know it it recurs. But when you have low moments like that public humiliation at the sheer hole, at the um, town hall, you also have these really high moments where Shiv kind of saves the company at the shareholder meeting um, in a really you know kind of remarkable uh, moment, taking the reins from an A wall Logan. Um, so I was wondering, as an actor. How does it feel to play Shiv at her most competent? Because she's off, you know, it's often stymied by other people and, you know, she feels yeah. kind of frustrated, but you finally have a moment where you get to, you know, act as uh, brilliantly as the character is. How does that feel? Oh, it's great. You know, and I, <laughs> I think, you know, for myself as Sarah, I've uh, at various times suffered from low confidence and, and self, low self-esteem and, and playing a character like Shiv, who sort of, whether she has low confidence, low self-esteem, is very capable about hiding it and sort of putting on this facade and, and this, I, I really love how she sort of gets into a trap and is very capable and very sort of determined and, and almost single-minded, uh, um, sorry, narrow, like tunnel vision about um, about the pursuit of something like in, in the shareholder meeting in, in episode five that is really fun to sort of gallop at that pace and go like, yeah, she's doing it, she's doing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, it's like the brilliance in the writing, you're never ever gonna get to that point where it's like, I won and also I'm being praised. Like at the same time, you can't actually ever get to that, that point because dad's always gonna bring you down or your brothers are gonna bring you down <laughs> or something else is gonna happen. And that's, you know, as an actor, that's the best part. It's like playing the conflict, it's great. Yeah, one of those, uh, you're mentioning the kind of tunnel vision of, of Shiv when she's pursuing a goal. One of the kind of um, consequences of that is the lack of attention to Tom. Um, and I'm so kind of fascinated as everybody is with what makes the relationship work even as dysfunctionally as it does. And there's such an ambiguity about for the audience Shiv's feelings toward Tom. Um, I'm wondering how much clarity do you have on knowing exactly why this relationship works um, and what is kind of, you know, stopping them from either, you know, moving to the next level and having children, which is a, a recurring question or, or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there's something in the trust from the actors that we just trust in the writing and that like just handing ourselves over and going, well, they are married and they are in love. And so 
we'll trust that you'll write appropriately to to that but you know as an actor you have to take responsibility for your character as well um and what i really enjoyed with this is is you know there's a level of not questioning it too much because if we find it in the moment if matthew and i are sort of engaged on the right page and right level then it does seem to work um and i think for shiv there is a lot of um right person right time for that time and then maybe things have changed and now she's suddenly got a husband who is you know this in the same company that she works in now as well her, their careers were separate before but now they're together uh now she's working you know in the same sort of division as him as well and everything's you know gotten married everything's like very close all of a sudden and i think shiv is somebody who has previously prospered in her life by keeping things organized at arm's length and that may be the um the pressure cooker sort of situation that's happening with tom proximity is is making it harder to do <laughs> it is i mean it, it is fun and remarkable to see just how supportive tom is despite you know the kind of dysfunction like in that shareholder meeting he immediately you know kind of comes to um check in on shiv after logan dismisses her accomplishments so it is kind of very rewarding to watch you know how yeah. even at the most fundamental the relationship works well i think there's like shiv is sort of a person who has through um her childhood experiences probably found it difficult to be vulnerable with people and i think you know i've presumed that they've met they met at some point where she was in you know the greatest need of of somebody to take care of her and to love her uh and found that in tom um and so is able to be vulnerable with him at times but not um not enough and certainly not i wouldn't think enough to sustain a marriage which is which is what slowly erodes you know that but i think also like in terms of their how they get along I, i've always felt that their rapport is often built at built upon like looking at other people and pointing at the things that are wrong and flaws that are wrong with other things or other people and, and you know that how some people can build rapport on on um antagonizing something else i don't think it's a good thing and i don't think that's you know, what builds a successful marriage you should have more commonality than that but i think there's something that like juvenile i guess in the way that they've related in that way perhaps yeah i also love how the older kind of characters throw this relationship into relief like this week um this we're talking now after the penultimate episode just aired this weekend so Harriet Walter returns as um as the mother which is such a wonderful role um and there's a fabulous scene between the two of you this week um really kind of digging into some of those yeah. old um old wounds um and also kind of triggers Shiv to make a decision with Tom but also what I find so rich about the conversation is Shiv choosing Logan over her mother um so that was making me kind of think about it, and I'm wondering if you did too uh what might shiv's path have looked like if she had chosen her mother over logan and was that actually ever a possibility do you think or was it always going to be you know what happened <laughs> where yeah. she is now i think i think it's um it's such a mess really cuz <laughs> cuz she was you know i'm you know, obviously I have to be but i also am protective of shiv as a character and as a person like as a 10 year old or a 13 year old being given the choice of like who do you want to live with and two parents were standing back like this it's not it's not it's not uh that's not fair on on a kid to ask that and so being blamed for that from from the parent looking down to say well you chose dad not me is like that's that's like a it's a mute point like you shouldn't that's not the child's choice <laughs> like you should just be there no matter what you know like and and for mom to have said have said that she was there in new york we never saw her as you know you sort of wonder what the truth of that is like, was she was she there or did she just not want to see her because she didn't think that she was going to be available emotionally to her or what's the it's never i think as easy or black and white um as it is spoken on either side and i think that's what's brilliant about particularly that scene there's so much more going on and so many more sort of uh there's just like iterations of of personal experience that are like you can't express in, in a single conversation it's like you have to go through therapy together to do it but you're never going to do that so it is it's just an onion you know it's you're my onion and I'm your fucking onion you know like we're never going to get to the bottom of it we're just going to make each other cry 
um, through all the different layers. Uh, yeah, I loved doing that scene. Um, we were doing it at two in the morning in Cortona. Yeah. And, like, and it took so long to get to the actual scene because we had to light it. And they were, they were shooting it and like, Cortona is just too beautiful. We can't have something so beautiful behind. We have to make it look uglier or something. I was like, it's Italy. It's going to be beautiful. What are you thinking? But, yeah. yeah, it looks yeah. It's amazing. I did want to ask you about the process, not necessarily of that scene, but I think what that scene encapsulates so well is how much on this series is unspoken, even though you have Jesse Armstrong and everybody else's phenomenal dialogue. There's so much communicated in reaction shots and just watching the characters who are not speaking. Um, yeah. So I wanted to know more about the process of how you shoot. Do you know at all times where the cameras are gonna be? Or if you're in a large ensemble scene, you know, are you just kind of playing and and are surprised to see what's actually captured on, on camera? Yeah, often surprised to see what was captured on camera. But um, we're, we're, oftentimes it's three cameras in the room with us and uh, we've got the camera people moving. It's often handheld or there's one at least on Dolly or, or still. Um, and what I love about it is that um, because they are fluid and because it sort of moves around and like if the camera's here, this camera might go into the shot and come back out again, just cut around. They're not going to use that bit, which makes it feel safer to fail in a way. It makes it feel like everything in the room is is part of the reality, is part of the fabric of this moment. Um, the editor and the director will cut around the parts that aren't useful, but you know, have an opinion, be in the room, see everything, don't sort of, I don't know, again, being an actor with tunnel vision, it might be harder to accept the reality of the camera moving around. And I think that that's what fills the moments and makes it sort of um, fizz because you can see, you can see it all. You can see the machi like the machinery behind it. It's great. Yeah. And speaking of kind of the trust and confidence in the process, I have to imagine that was useful uh, when you were doing that now kind of viral scene in the birthday episode of Shiv dancing. Um, I feel like that what makes that so much fun is it's so uncharacteristic and feels like such a release for a character who for three seasons has been very kind of probably bottling up so many of her emotions. Yeah. So how is that for you to play um, as Shiv, but also just kind of like, you know, letting it go? It was great. It was like both as an actor, as Sarah, I don't think I danced. I love dancing and I don't think I'd been to a club or dance for over a year because of the pandemic. So it was like, great. I get to be in a sea of people and throw myself around and make some shapes. Brilliant. Bring it on. Let's turn that music up. And then as, but then you have to make it sort of work as, as the character as well. And we found this song, this uh, Dizzy Rascal song, um, Don't Gas Me. And for me, as like working out, you know, like you were saying before about what, what might have happened in Shiv's past or childhood, had this idea that she might have like been studying in London or the UK at college and in a sort of a rebellious early 20s time, been dating some producer from like the early grime scene and like the wrong person to be dating in the eyes of the Roy family. And but like hearing a Dizzy Rascal song, like harking back to that time is just like, bleh. I'm going to go back to what sort of chaotic childhood, uh, you know, early twenties that she had, that she probably would have been some rebellious daughter in a moment, but very clever about it. Always leaving through the kitchen at the back and not leaving through the front door to be photographed. That is so rich. Um, and, you know, it brings me to another question, which is you've now played Shiv for almost 30 hours of, of screen time which is a long time, but it sounds like you're constantly finding and learning new things about the character. So what, you know, like, what are you surprised by or continue to be amazed by when you, you know, discover a new facet of, of Shiv? Yeah, the, um, there was, it's, it's not in the episode. I, I saw episode nine last night and it's great. And I'm very excited for everybody to see it. Um, but there was a, a moment in the scene uh, there's a scene where the three siblings are standing with each other and there was a moment in that which didn't make the cut but there was a sort of a kind of maternal instinct that came into Shiv that was like I'm the only woman here 
and not that that's a bad thing and or a competitive thing but it was like right we're doing this we're doing this so like organizing being like mother hen for this moment i was like i wonder if shiv was sort of maybe like that back in her 20s or you know at work and and just going like you're doing like the sort of organizational person in that way and that how that translates into her family life in a mother hen kind of way and and in a way that i would never have thought shiv had a shred of maternal instinct but maybe the kind of the bossiness or something like that of it uh, mm. came about so whether that sort of remains for the next season and like i find something there to sort of build upon who knows maybe it's not useful and it'll be gotten rid of um but i like doing that i like sort of meeting her again and discovering her because we're all complex individuals you know in life yeah. and and constantly changing in little ways yeah big. we and, are only like a few days out from the season finale um, is there anything that you can tease us on for the season finale, or if not, um, anything else you know you're kind of hoping to see in season four? Oh, I'm just hoping to see <laughs> season four. I don't know <laughs> what is going to happen, how we're going to do it. Like, I can't wait to see what they come up with to for season four. There's some great scenes in in oh, Brian is particularly brilliant in episode nine. There's just such a strength and power in this very casual like grounded way yeah he's brilliant it's just so much fun to watch the scenes that you don't get to see because you're not in them um and it's one of my favorite lines is in in one of my favorite shiv lines is in um this next episode okay we are extremely <laughs> eager to to hear it um sarah snook <laughs> congratulations on the third season of succession thanks so much for talking to gold derby today thanks for having me